Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to all of you for being here. So indeed, my name is Mikko. I am from Finland and I will be speaking about where we're going. There's really a nice echo in the room. Well, I can cut to the chase right away. I do believe that there is job security in security. The things we've been doing for the last decades aren't going to go anywhere. Sometimes I get questions about this. That, you know, aren't you working in an industry that if you're really good at what you do, you make yourself irrelevant? Like you will engineer yourself out of a job. And that's true. Like if we actually are able to do that, if we actually would be able to build vulnerable or systems which have no vulnerabilities, if we could actually be able to fix every bug, if we would actually be able to stop every attack, we would all be out of a job. And of course, that's not going to happen, because in the end, it's not really a question about technical vulnerabilities or whether people can be fooled to do stupid things. It's really a question about whether there will be bad people in the future. And I can tell you there will be bad people in the future, like there's always been. And if there is an opportunity for a criminal to make a lot of money in a way where it's very unlikely for them to be caught or sentenced, someone somewhere is going to do it. And the internet took away geography. I've been discussing statistics in many different countries with local law enforcement. And we are, depending on the country, but we are on the verge where it's now more likely for the citizens to become a victim of a crime in the real world or in the online world. For those of us living in Western safe societies, like for example in the Netherlands, the likelihood that you become a victim of a real world crime exists, but it's not very high, especially when you compare to, I don't know, South America or Africa or places like that, where real world crime is much more common. But when we leave the real world, when we go to the online world, then we are no longer in the Netherlands or in any physical location. It's easy to say that internet takes away geography and it takes away borders, because that's what it does. But it's harder to really understand what it means for our risk level. Internet is the best thing that has happened during our lifetime and the worst thing that has happened during our lifetime. The internet is the legacy we will be leaving behind. When people, let's say hundreds of years in the future, will look back at our time, the early 2000s, the number one thing they will think about us is that those were the people who first went online. These were the first people online. That's the big thing that's going to stay in history books about our time. That's going to be our legacy. And we have all lived through multiple technological revolutions. Multiple technological revolutions during our lifetime. Mobile phones, computers, internet, now IoT. They're all shaping the world around us. And this is happening very, very quickly. So I live in Finland. Finland has 1600 kilometers of border with the Russians. I work in security. We do a lot of work re or re researching what the Russian attackers are doing, both criminal as well as governmental attackers. Because as Finns, we've always known we have to keep a close eye on the Russians. Both my grandfathers fought the Russians in the Second World War. My mother, Rauha, was born two months after the peace treaty in 1945. That's why she was called Rauha. Rauha is the Finnish word for peace. She was born two months after the peace was agreed on and she was named Rauha. She went to work with computers in 1968. 1968. Nobody was working with computers in 1968. My mother was. I was born in 1969 myself, which means when I was a young boy, I would play around the house with punch cards and punch tape that my mom would bring home from work. 50 years is a long time, but in technology it has changed everything. 50 years ago we went to the moon. We were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing just two months ago. 
And next month, in October, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of this. This is a notebook, an IMP log notebook, dated October 1969. And it has a line in it on the 29th of October 1969 at 10.30 p.m. in the evening, first packet on ARPANET, which would later become the Internet, was successfully sent from one computer to another. The first packet will celebrate the 50th anniversary on the 29th of next month. I told you I was born in 1969. I was born a little bit before this. I'm, I'm actually older than the Internet. This is how old Internet is, all right? <laughs> That's what it looks like. And 50 years, well, of course, to me, it's a long time. I've been alive for a very long while, I think. But when you look at development of mankind and, and our history and how technology shapes the world around us, this is nothing. Things have changed very, very quickly. And the Internet revolution is already behind us. The Internet revolution already happened. I've been working for F-Secure for a very long time. I joined the company as employee number six in 1991. Now we have 1,700, 1,800 people around the world. And in many ways our work has changed, but in some ways it hasn't. For example, every morning we go to our office, we sit down at a table where we have a computer, and we bang on the keyboard all day, and then we go home. This is what we were doing in 1991. This is what we do today. But there is one big difference which nicely illustrates how the Internet Revolution already happened. In 1991, when I was doing my daily work at the office, if I needed to move files from one computer to another, we did not have a local area network. Obviously, we didn't have Internet, because of course in 1991 nobody had Internet like that, but we didn't even have a LAN. I mean, we were an IT company, and we didn't have a local area network. We got our first LAN in the end of 1992, which means if you wanted to move files around, you were using the thumb drive of the 1990s to move them around. And this is what the revolution really means. We've had computers for decades. What the Internet revolution did was that it took every single computer on the planet to the Internet. And this has already happened. It's very hard to find a computer anymore which is not online. Every computer is online. And now we are in the beginning of the next revolution, which is the IoT revolution or the revolution of connected devices. And this is in the very beginning. Because it's not about smart devices. It's more about stupid devices. Smart devices, we all know the risks. I am the father of the Hyppönen law, which says that if it's smart, it's vulnerable, which is a very easy law to justify. When you add functionality and connectivity into everyday devices, like televisions or fridges, they inherently become hackable, because now they're running code, now they are online. But at least the consumers who buy smart fridges or smart televisions know that these things are online. The reason why they buy them is that they are online. The reason why people buy smart televisions is that they want to watch Netflix on their TV. The reason why people buy smart fridges is that they, when they're shopping, they want to be able to look inside of their fridge with a built-in webcam. These are features which users want. But what's going to happen in the very near future is that devices which are not smart will be going online as well. Devices where the consumers don't need the things to be online. Stupid things, things like toasters, because we don't need our toasters on the internet. We don't need an app to tell us that the toast is done. We don't need that. But they're going to be online anyway. And they're going to be online, and everything will be online, and everything will become a computer, because data is money. Data has become money. Money has also become data, thanks to cryptocurrencies. But data has also quite concretely become valuable. Maybe it's just a different version of the data is the new oil saying, or data is uranium saying, which is even better, because uranium is very valuable and very problematic, just like data is very valuable 
and very problematic. Nevertheless, data is valuable. This means that toaster manufacturers, among others, want to collect data. They would collect it already today if they could, but they can't because it's still too expensive. But in the very near future, it won't be. In the very near future, the cost of adding connectivity and functionality for collecting and sending data is going to be insignificant. You can add it to any device which uses electricity, and then they will. And that means that consumers who buy these things in their homes won't even be told that this thing that you bought actually is online because it's not online for the consumer. It's online for the manufacturer. And there won't be any easy way of preventing this because you can't block these devices on your gateway because they won't be using your Wi-Fi or any of the connectivity channels that you control. They're going to be online using 5G, 6G, Sigfox, ZigBee 3, any of these new technologies that we are developing right now. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is these things compete with price. Cheapest wins. When you go buying toasters, the number one selling point is price. You're not asking questions about well, I wonder what kind of a firewall is built into my toaster. No. Especially if you don't even know it's online. And we have, over the years, had the tendency of coming up with great innovations, which initially seemed like a great idea, and then much, much later we realized that they were a horrible idea. Let me show this by playing you a TV ad from 1960s. Smart woman, she's putting a new floor down by herself. Wise woman, she's using Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. Easiest flooring to install, easiest flooring to care for. Save every way with Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. This smart woman was using asbestos tiles. Asbestos, which was such a great innovation. Miracle material, which you could you know, shape in any form you wanted, which wouldn't catch fire, which was great for insulation, and also, as we dis discovered later, horrible for our health. And we're battling with asbestos problems even still today. And what we are doing right now could be characterized as IT asbestos. The idea where we put everything online turn everything into a computer with the cheapest possible technology, embedding an outdated Linux kernel, which cannot be patched by the users, with built-in root passwords, which cannot be changed by the user, and then putting these by the millions into the open internet with all ports exposed. This will be the asbestos of the future. This will be the problem that our children and future generations will curse us for. And this is what we are doing right now. It seems like a great idea right now. To me, it sounds like it could come back to haunt us. And in some ways, it's already happening. Last week, we released our latest um, report uh, on, on threat detections. Our half-a-year report, which included what we see on our honeypots. We run a global network of honeypots which collect attacker traffic. And for the last 20 years, number one detections on those honeypots have, of course, been Windows malware. Windows worms, Windows bots, the usual. Well, in the latest report, for the first time ever, it's Linux. Linux is finally mainstream. Instead of Windows detections being number one on our honeypots, we're now seeing Linux detections as number one. And of course, these are IoT detections. We're not speaking about malware worms and bots spreading on desktop or server Linux distributions. These are IoT, bare bones Linux installations. Nevertheless, it is Linux malware for the first time ever. And we see old protocols come back to haunt us. The kind of problems that we already fixed and solved long, long time ago come back to haunt us. Big part of this traffic that we're seeing is actually Telnet traffic. 
Telnet. God damn Telnet traffic. We haven't been using Telnet on our servers since 1990s because it's a horribly bad idea. It's an unencrypted terminal protocol which was completely replaced by SSH in the mid-1990s. Now, for some reason that I can't explain, these new IoT de devices are running Telnet D and we have Telnet worms going around the world in massive numbers again. I thought we fixed this already. Apparently, we did it. IT asbestos at work. Another thing which will stay with us in the future that we are about to enter is the fact that attacks can be divided into either technical attacks or people attacks. That's not going to change. Because you can take any single attack we've ever seen and you can either divide it into a technical problem or a people problem. Either it was a bug in the code, which then became a vulnerability, which was, was then exploited by someone. Or it was a human which was tricked to do something stupid. Sometimes people ask me, then how come we can't make systems which wouldn't have vulnerabilities? And then I have to explain to them that, you know, vulnerabilities aren't anything special, they're just bugs. And we've always had bugs, and we always will have bugs, as long as programs are written by human beings. Because people make mistakes. We could argue that one day programs will not be written by human beings. One day they will be written by machine learning systems and artificial intelligence. And then maybe we will finally have a day where we will not have vulnerabilities, or the vulnerabilities will be so complicated that we won't be able to exploit them. But those days are still way, way in the distant future. So for now, we have these two sets of problems. And whenever we have people problems, like phishing or password reused or CEO scams or business email compromise attacks, whenever that happens, whenever it hits the headlines, the typical reaction is that, oh my God, look at these stupid users. How idiot do you have to be to fall for scams like that? And I'm sick and tired of users always getting the blame. Because today, every modern society expects everybody to be online. From teenage girls to grandmothers, everybody needs to be online because all of our services are, are online. And we can't really expect much about the security awareness level of the average citizen. So, blaming the user for these problems isn't going to solve anything. It's not stupid users, it's stupid systems. And in many ways, we should be taking away the responsibility from the users who can't take the responsibility to begin with and put the responsibility to where it belongs. And it belongs to operating system manufacturers, to security companies, and also to telcos and operators which provide the actual connectivity through which the attacks are done. So last month I was in um, Kent, in the United Kingdom, um, discussing with a CFO of a local real estate company about a business email compromise that they were hit with. They were hit with a CEO scam, they lost money. A typical problem where you, you can just you know, say that, you know, how stupid do you have to be to fall for a Nigerian scam? Well, in this particular case, what happened was that the real estate company which, was, which became the victim was a local company buying and selling real estate. And then they agreed to, uh, to um, acquire a local legacy company which had been around for decades. Small company with a couple of employees because the founder of the small company wanted to retire and sell his business to the bigger company. All right? They met face to face, they knew each other, they met face to face multiple times. CEOs of both companies were discussing the details of the deal, they agreed to do it, they started to write a, uh, a, a legal agreement on the acquiring details of the company, which they were doing over email. They were sending a word document back and forth, trying to you know, finalize the agreement, and finally when they were both happy, all right, we can do this, let's, let's do it. 
Then the bigger company CEO sent an email to the smaller company CEO asking for details how we can pay the down payment for you, for your company. And the old man replied, and that email, that one email, that was the email which was intercepted by the attackers, which had all along been sitting on the Office 365 installation of the company, watching all of this happen and doing nothing, just waiting for the right time. And then when the right time appeared, someone is asking for an account number, they halted all external email out from the small company and then started taking over the email communication from there on. And that isn't really a stupid user. The CEO of the company which was fooled, how could he know? Like, this was a real deal. He actually knew what he was buying. He had met the people. He was exchanging emails for weeks. If nobody's told him, if nobody's educated him about how these attacks actually work, how on earth would he have known? If somebody would have told him, then of course he would have made the phone call and confirmed the account number over phone or something. But if you don't know, you're never going to do that. It's not really a question of stupid users, and it's lazy for us security people to blame the user for problems like this. In a similar manner, whenever I'm visiting our customers and clients, one thing I've started doing is that I ask to be shown around. Like, could somebody take me around your, your offices here? Oh, I'd like to see what you do. And most companies are really happy to do this. Let's go for a walk. Let's have a look around. Here's our manufacturing department. Here's our design department. Here's our sales. Here's our top management. And then I ask if we could go to the financial people. And then we go to the CFO's office. Here's our CFO. Nice to meet you. Here's our controller. Then I ask, where are the people who actually pay the bills? And then we go and meet the people who pay the bills. If it's a smaller company, it's one person. If it's a large enterprise, it could be five persons. So far, every single time, the people who pay the bills look like this. Like really nice middle-aged ladies. And I talk with them that, okay, so what do you do? Well, I pay the bills. All right. How do you pay the bills? Well, I use this online banking system on my computer. And she shows, shows a desktop, typically running... Windows 10 or something like that. And I have this smart card to authenticate to the bank system and all that. Cool. All right. Then I ask her, that, uh, how much money do you move through this computer every month? And of course, answers differ, but it could be like 200,000 euros or half a million dollars or three million dollars or whatever. Cool. And then I ask my last question, the killer question, which is, could you now show me the computer that you use for going to Facebook and YouTube and for Googling stuff. Like, where's that? And now they're confused. Like, what do you mean? And you can almost see a light bulb go on top of their head when they realize that, hmm, I just told this guy that I move half a million euros through this computer every month. Why am I going to Facebook with the same computer? Which is a really good question. And this really isn't rocket science. It's about thinking about the attacks and the threat surface, because that computer, that's the prime computer banking Trojan gangs want to get their hands on. And the more that computer is used for anything else than just receiving bills and paying the bills, the higher the risk it is that it will be taken over. Computers are cheap. You can just have her have another computer for doing everything else, and then one computer only for paying the bills. And security needs time to evolve. Security and safety both need this. I'll show you a photo about what seat belts used to look like. <laughs> it's the right idea. It is a good idea. It just needs still a little bit evolvement. And the same thing applies to security. When you look at any of the things we've innovated over the last decades, None of it was ready when it was innovated. It needs time out there in the field. It needs real users to use them for real to see what works and what doesn't. And sometimes it feels like we're doing no progress at all. We keep hearing about companies getting hacked and massively large data breaches over and over again. 
And when you look at that, it's easy to forget that we actually are making progress. Just look where we were 10 years ago and look where we are today. The systems we use today are so much better than what they used to be. We are getting better. The attackers, of course, are trying to catch up. But 10 years ago, look at the computers we were running. Windows XP was still number one operating system 10 years ago. And by the way, Windows XP did not have a firewall by default. XP Service Pack Zero didn't have a firewall. Like you, you plug that onto the internet, every port was open. That's how bad it was. Over the last 10 years, new modern mobile systems have taken over the world. Android and iOS. They, of course, still have problems, but overall, when you look at the safety and security level of the devices we have in our pockets, these are really, really well secured compared to anything we used to have before, and they are superior to our computers. Our mobile phones are superior in their security model to our computers for the basic reason that you can't just simply write code on it and give that code to anyone else. You have to go through the App Store model and verification model before it's, it's actually globally available. So we are making progress. It doesn't always feel like that. And it's especially hard to feel like we're making progress when you look at the, the best attackers out there. Especially when you look at governments and the kind of work they do. Governments have the biggest budgets, and they are the most persistent attacker. The problem with governmental attacks isn't really about anything else as about persistence. Sometimes we use the word APT to describe governmental attacks, and there, the abbreviation, Advanced Persistent Threat, the key word really is the P, persistent. If you have a persistent attacker, an attacker who won't give up, then you have a problem. Because normal attackers give up. Normal attackers are not after you. Normal attackers are after money. And if it's too hard, too slow, too expensive to hack you, they will forget about you. They will go after an easier target. They will go after the low-hanging fruit. And believe me, when I tell you that the internet is a garden of low-hanging fruits, there's like so many easier targets than you if you do any basic work to securing your networks. So it's really easy to avoid criminal attackers compared to governmental attackers, because governmental attackers don't change their mind. They don't give up. The reason why they don't change their mind is that these guys typically work for a military organization. And what people inside military organizations do is that they follow orders. So these guys have been given an order. You, you, and you go and hack that company in that country, steal this information, report back when you've done it. Go. That kind of an order. And if that's the framework you're working in, that's what you're going to do. You're going to hack that company. And if you can't get in, if it's too slow, too expensive, too hard to get in, you're not going to change your mind. You're not going to change your mind. We can't get into this company. Never mind. Let's hack someone else. You're not going to do that. You're going to keep trying until you get in. You will try different tactics, different techniques. You bring in more people. You bring in more resources. If you can't figure out any other way, then you finally get one of your own guys or girls recruited as an employee of the company to gain access to the information. If the attacker doesn't give up and has unlimited or basically unlimited time, eventually they will get in. And that's why fighting governmental attackers are so hard. And that's why you shouldn't even try. You shouldn't rely on that anything you do would keep them outside of your network. Instead, you should focus on being able to detect when they get in. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have firewalls or gateways or proxies or any of that. Of course, we should. It makes our job easier. But we shouldn't rely that they will keep everybody out. There is an unlimited amount of attacks. We can only imagine a limited amount of those attacks. And if we only put our effort into building walls around our systems, then we are not going to be looking inside of our systems for signs of a breach. 
so we could detect when we have a breach, so we could react when there is a breach. And this is what we see very clearly inside our incident response teams, the teams inside of our company which are called when a company is hacked. Because almost always the company which calls us assumes they've just been hacked, and then we have to tell them that they were hacked last year, or two years ago, or three years ago. They just didn't realize, because they weren't looking, because they were assuming that whatever solutions they bought will keep everybody out. <coughs> and as we start speaking about governmental attackers, it's always two countries which make the headlines. China and Russia. Russia and China. Why these two? Well, it's not because other countries would not be attacking, because other countries are attacking, including like civilized Western democracies, like United Kingdom and United States. There are victims of Western intelligence agencies hacking within a hundred mile radius from where we are right now. However, Western intelligence agencies really, really, really don't want to get caught. Russians and Chinese don't really care. That's where the difference really is. That's why we keep seeing much more of the cases coming from Russia and China. Most of the cases which we know of coming from Western intelligence agencies have been, have became public knowledge because of a whistleblower or then something extraordinary like Stuxnet, which became public because of complicated issues. But Russia and China are both massively large countries. Russia is the biggest country on the planet. China has more people than any other country on the planet. Both countries are filled with great minds, great coders, great engineers, great physicists, great everything. So with that in mind, it's quite surprising how different these countries are in exporting their technology. We all have Chinese chips in our pockets right now. Everybody in the room has something made in China in their pocket. None of you have anything made in China in your pockets. Unless somebody is carrying a Kalashnikov. And if you're carrying a Kalashnikov, don't tell me. And isn't this a little bit surprising? Like, what a big difference between these two countries. And of course, this then means that during times of conflict and during times of crisis, China has a completely different visibility onto the rest of the world, which is partially the explanation why we are in the middle of a trade war between United States and China right now, especially with the talk around Huawei and ZTE. There's no evidence that any of these massively large Chinese tech companies would be cooperating directly with the Chinese government to spy on the rest of the world. It, it's possible. I mean, it's technically doable. That's what's worrying about it. These companies have been caught for spying when you speak about industrial espionage. For example, Huawei has been spying on other companies to steal technology, which they use in their own products. But that's completely different for working as a tool for your government to spy on the rest of the world. Nevertheless, it's quite clear that we are now in an arms race. Cyber arms race, if you will. The word cyber is complicated, as you know. Many of here still remember the time when someone used the word cyber. What they meant was cyber sex. Nowadays, when generals talk about doing cyber, they don't mean cyber sex. They mean something else. And cyber weapons work. Cyber weapons get the job done. Cyber weapons are affordable, effective, and deniable. Effective, affordable, deniable. That's a pretty good weapon. When the weapon gets the job done, it's cheaper than alternatives, and you can deny that it wasn't your weapon to begin with. So when we speak about computer attacks, are we speaking about actual war? First ever review of international cyber attacks that computer sabotage emanating from another country can constitute an act of war. Computer attack emanating from another country constitutes an act of war. 
This is a news clip from 15 years ago already. The question of whether cyber attacks are actually something you can retaliate with traditional weapons is a very good question. Because we have this small problem called attribution in the middle. How do you actually know who attacked you if the attack isn't about a B-52 flying over your head, dropping bombs, but about something more virtual? Well, sometimes it can be done. We all remember the example from uh, May this year, as Israeli Defense Forces spokesperson announced that they had launched a kinetic attack with missiles to retaliate against a cyber attack unit of Hamas. And this is as real world as it gets. But here attribution maybe is easier to do than in most other cases. Because here Israel Defense Forces has been doing similar attacks before to target, for example, the propaganda units of Hamas. Again, basically office workers who are not shooting anybody but are doing work to support the effort. If that's a valid target, then I guess cyber is a valid target as well. And in this case, I guess they had good enough intelligence to believe that they are bombing the right building. But as cyber war is this word that is being used to describe attacks like these, it's good to know that I, I don't really think we will ever see a cyber war between two countries. I don't believe we will ever see a war where two countries are just attacking each other online. Because cyber is just a domain. And technology has always shaped the conflicts we fight with each other. Hundreds of years ago, we, the only technology we had were swords. So all, all wars we had were land wars, until we got good enough technology to build warships. And innovation of warships, which created sea war, didn't make land war disappear. Conflict just expanded from land to sea. Then technology shaped conflict again. We got air war. Then we got satellites and shit. So space war. And now today, cyberspace war. But you know what? These five domains for war that we have today are not going to be the only ones. There will be future domains, new domains for war. Domains for war that we can't imagine today. Or uh, if we try to imagine what they might be, it's going to be really, sound really science fiction-like. Because, you know, we might be speaking about things like DNA warfare or nano warfare. What could nano warfare look like in distant future? Well, you can imagine enemy planes flying over your land, dropping nanobots which would then be airborne and enter the bloodstream of your soldiers and go to their brains to change their thoughts. And if that sounds like science fiction to you, exactly. Just like cyber war sounded like science fiction 30 years ago. So there will be new domains for conflict, new domains for war. And as we speak about machine learning and artificial intelligence, I actually believe that this development is going to increase the likelihood of conflict, not decrease, but increase the likelihood of conflicts. Just imagine, even if you don't believe in strong, wide AI, just for a moment, imagine that a company or a country would announce that they are on the verge of massive new development and they believe they will have superhuman intelligence in their hands next month. How would other countries react? Other countries would see that and they would immediately realize that, holy hell, if those guys get that capability, it's going to be game over. They will win everything. They will be superior in everything. They will beat us in any competition. They will win every war. So no matter what, no matter what's the cost, we must steal that technology. And if we can't steal that technology, we must destroy that technology. So it's going to be a really interesting development if we ever will see 
something which would start to resemble human intelligence. And if we will see that, I do believe it's going to come from brain simulators. There's multiple projects underway already trying to simulate the whole human brain, which is very hard to do, and we're not even close. But it's easy to see that if we're able to simulate a whole human brain, obviously that thing is intelligent, just like we are. It just doesn't have a body. And then if you scale it up, and it's like... 10 billion times faster than a real human brain, then it would be superhuman intelligence. Is that going to happen? Maybe. I don't know. Artificial intelligence is shaping our world. All the development around deep fakes is going to have effects on our world. However, I think we all saw the news this month about the first uh, CEO scam attack done with... I have to pause this because I know you can't listen to me when you're watching this. It's impossible. We all heard the news about deep fake voice used in a CEO scam. This month, where a company, I believe in Germany, was spoofed because someone called them and they had a deep fake voice resembling their CEO. I don't believe that. I'm calling bullshit on that one. Not because it couldn't be doable. It is doable. It's probably doable already today. I just think it's not likely that that's the way it was done. I think it's more likely that they just had a guy who sounded like the CEO instead of having some real-time deep fake voice generator which would do that. Or maybe it wasn't even that. Maybe it's just a good cover story. It's like what we spoke earlier about blaming the user. Like how stupid do you have to be to fall for a CEO scam? Well, imagine if you are the one who was fooled. It's a pretty good story that, you know, I'm not stupid. I was fooled by a completely new kind of an attack, which we've never seen before, which would fool anybody. It was a deep fake. Now, we don't really know, because we don't have the recording of the call. But I don't, I'm not going to buy that deep fakes have really been used in real attacks unless I see proof. But it will be done in the future. And artificial intelligence will be used in attacks in the future. And if you don't believe me, maybe you believe this guy. Будущее не только Россия, это будущее всего человечества. Здесь колоссальные возможности и трудно прогнозируемые сегодня угрозы. Тот, кто станет лидером в этой сфере, будет властелином мира. Кто лидером в этой сфере станет лидером мира. Who leads artificial intelligence will rule the world. So machine learning is part of the puzzle. And today all security companies are using machine learning for defense. In the near future it's going to be used for offense as well. We haven't actually seen that yet. We've only seen attackers trying to poison our systems that use machine learning uh, for defense. But we actually haven't seen attackers use machine learning as real attacks. So we got to stop relying on just building the walls around our networks. Got to put more and more effort into just accepting that whatever walls we build, they won't keep everybody out. And if somebody gets in, we have to be able to detect that there's a breach so we can react when there is a breach. And when security works, it's invisible. Tomorrow, in the biggest newspaper here in the Netherlands, you will not see a headline which says that the second largest Dutch company was not hacked yesterday. Like That's not going to be news. If it is hacked, then that will be news. And that means that we have to keep succeeding in our work every time. And when we do that, it's invisible. Nobody sees that. If we fail, then it's going to be very visible. And rarely is anyone thanked for the work they did to prevent the disaster that didn't happen. Rarely is anyone thanked for the work they did to prevent the disaster that didn't happen. So I want to thank you for the work that you are doing to prevent the disasters. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Mikko. I said he has to run to catch his flight. There is an option B, but we hope the option one will work. Mm. So unfortunately, no time for questions. Thank you to fit us into the tight schedule. Yeah, thank you. For you all, again, a warm applause for him. Thank you.